Welcome to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 54. My name is Alina Warwick, and today we have Maggie Cook on the show. Just a side note, if you guys are listening to this episode with kids around, please put on some headphones because there are some details in this episode that is, well, not kid approved. Before we continue with this episode, I wanted to ask if you can share some love by subscribing to the podcast and leaving a rating. If you leave a rating, your name may be dropped in one of my future episodes. So stay tuned and connected. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I struggled the most was not having food for weeks because we just didn't have the means. And so I became a hunter with my brothers and we would just go up into the woods at night and we would hunt with these spotlights. And that's how we ate. Maggie's journey to success is just one of a kind. This episode definitely brings me tears to this day as I listen to it over and over. After living a life of suffering in an orphanage for 18 years, Maggie created mindset strategies that changed her life. In this episode, you'll hear how she found basketball for a means of escaping the orphanage and taught herself how to play blindfolded. Maggie definitely went through so much in her 18 years of living at the orphanage that molded her to such a unique individual that never stops learning and always accepting challenges. Maggie started her company at 23 years old, all by accident, with $800 after she was homeless. After 90 rejections to put her salsa into grocery stores, she went into Whole Foods and got the product on their shelves. Maggie later sold her company to Campbell Soup for $231 million. Now, she helps entrepreneurs discover their hidden personal power so they can increase their revenue and change the world. With 30 years of experience, Maggie now dedicates her life to helping others unleash their full potential, specializing in mind optimization techniques to accelerate true success. Let's dive right in and hear all about the amazing journey Maggie went through. All right, Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I truly appreciate your time. And oh my goodness, I am so excited to talk to you about your journey. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. Tell us where you're from and when did you come to the United States? I am from Michoacán, Mexico. And I came to the United States when I was 18 years old. 18 years old. Okay, great. So you grew up in an orphanage, is that right? Yes. What was that like? Oh, gosh, it was not normal. (laughs) I thought it was normal the way that I grew up. But once I came to the U.S., I saw how families are so much different. I mean, I grew up in an environment where there was more than... 200 kids at one time. And I had 68 siblings that my caregivers adopted so that we all had the same last name. So there were 68 of us. And it was just a really tough time. I mean, imagine, can you imagine there's two people to care for all these kids? I mean, it's impossible without having so many issues and so many problems and people getting so frustrated that you begin to get abused and physically and psychologically and all these things just because there's just so much going on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I struggled the most was not having food for weeks because we just didn't have the means. And so I became a hunter with my brothers and we would just go up into the woods at night and we would hunt with these spotlights. And that's how we ate. And what would you hunt for? We would hunt for a liebre. I hunted so much armadillo. It's crazy because I'm a vegan now. (laughs) Oh, wow. Going back, I'm like, oh my gosh, but we did it to survive. But we would hunt rabbit. We would hunt any kind of bird that we could get. Anything that was available in the woods that we could get, we would catch it, do the thing, and then clean it up and cook it and then eat it and come back to the orphanage. And at first I was bringing back animals and food, but then we got in trouble. So we just 
kept it up in the woods. And that's how I, when I was hungry, we ate. Mm -hmm. And so I read that you dug caves somewhere out there and you would hide in there. Why would you do that? Yes. So there was so much going on, right? And I mean, you would get kids who would come in completely broken. There was just so much suffering and so much abuse sometimes. And I created the secret hiding place. And it was a cave that I started digging on the side of a canyon. And the canyon was impossible to walk through because it was so steep. And I would say it was probably about a football field length from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I found a little spot and I just started digging. And I remember I would take like the dirt and not, like not do the big hole there because people would notice that something's going on. I would just spread it around. And it was probably about, I'm going to talk in meters. That's how I can see the cave. Yeah. It was probably three meters in, probably less than a meter round, three mm -hmm. meters in straight, and then another five meters to the right. So it had like an L shape so that I could, like nobody could find me so that I could hide. But that became my secret hiding place for peace and just to get away from stuff and Either that or just going into the woods and dream that I was some kind of superhero or I was always looking for ways to distract my mind from feeling fear or mm -hmm. pain or suffering. So that's what I did. Mm. And how old were you when you were digging up these caves and hiding places? I would say six, seven years old. Mm -hmm. And I actually still have my knife that I dug the cave with. And I take it when I speak and I show it to people, except for when I have to travel, because of course you don't, you can't take a knife when you fly, but yeah, yeah, I still have it. I remember that I would bring my food even from, because there you could get like tropical food sometimes from the woods if it was the right time of year. And I remember bringing food like that back into the cave. And then if I would come back, like if I wasn't there for a day, I would go back in and I noticed that the animals had eaten my food. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so now I was like, okay. So I remember I used to do these little holes in the walls of the cave and I would take water and I would make mud and I would put the food in, patch the hole and put an X, like a little treasure. Yeah. And when I would get hungry, I would just dig it out and eat it. And that's how I started. I was just very inventive and very like, how do you say creative yeah creative and a dreamer because I just wanted to experience the opposite of fear and so mm -hmm. I created my own little worlds and I think that saved me from mm -hmm. a lot of the things that the choices because a lot of kids that I grew up with ended up making other choices that led them to different paths that weren't so good and mm -hmm. so yeah Wow. And how old were you when you came to the orphanage were you an infant I was born there. Oh, you were born there? Yes. Oh, okay. So did you know your biological parents? Yes, my parents were like caregivers. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you were not an orphan. You just grew up in the orphanage. Right, right. Got and it. the thing that I want to point out is that, because there's eight of us biological siblings and okay, we're so close now, you know, right now. And mm -hmm. ever since everybody left the orphanage, because we believe that we probably suffered the most. And just because, and I didn't realize this until later, like when I was a young adult, when I mm -hmm. caught my caregivers, my mom and dad speaking to each other in a kitchen, saying that, that she should not pay attention to us because he was afraid that the other kids would feel resentful because they're not biological kids. Therefore, they would run away or do like bad things would happen. So we were disciplined more. We were, <laughs> we got in trouble more, put it that way. And we were less believed for any kind of reason than the other kids, which was very hard for us. And that's why we're so close now mm -hmm. because we understand our suffering and we're a true, true family, all of us. Yeah. Wow. And what do you think caused or what was that inclination in your parents to open up the orphanage and take in 68 kids? That is a really good question. And the answer is, I heard him 
speak about this several times. And then I heard my mother talk about it years later after he passed that they needed to have more and more kids because that was the only way that they would get support from organizations in the U.S. because Mm -hmm. we didn't get any support from the Mexican government. Mm -hmm. But the thing that happened is that he was a doctor, right? And he would get all this money, sometimes nothing, but sometimes he would get some money. And instead of using it to feed us, he had an interest to feeding or taking care of like people in the villages or the poor people that they would have fights about feeding us, about doing things for us. Like I remember when I was in, oh gosh, middle school that we didn't have shoes and the teachers were so mad because a lot of us went to school in town and they would get so mad at him because we all had guaraches. You know what a guarache is? No. Guarache is a, a Mexican sandal. Sandals, okay. Yeah, they're made out of cow hide. Okay. Like skin. And they were so mad because we are not supposed to go to school like that. We're supposed to have black shoes and we didn't have money. So he he put all of our guaraches in Chapopote, which is like that black tar that you put on the roof to okay. make it black. And they were even more mad. <laughs> but that's how, oh my how poor we were growing up. So they basically didn't get any support from the Mexican government or from the U.S. government to run this orphanage. Right, right. It was just people and organizations like churches here in America that would send money down to Mexico whenever they felt like supporting. Mm. So what was medical care like for all of you guys? If you guys got sick, what would happen? Well, he was a doctor, so he would take care of us and by any means. He had a little clinic in the orphanage and he would actually give medical attention to the poor on Sundays. And I remember if we all had to have like um Macuna, like a shot for polio or something, mm-hmm. you would have the longest line of all these kids lined up for to get. I mean, we were taken care of medically. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. And you said you guys didn't get any food for weeks sometimes. What would the other kids do? I mean, you, you went out hunting with your brothers. And then when you try to come back with the food, you got in trouble. What were the other kids doing? Were they running away to try to find some food? A lot of times kids that were adopted or that would just come to stay for a place, they would run away. And I honestly don't know what the rest of them did other than I do remember we had a bodega, which is like a storage room for food. And we started breaking in or they started breaking in and they put locks on it. And then there's a little window on the side of it. And I start breaking in to get food for everybody. And then they put barras, like metal bars on mm-hmm. the window. Mm-hmm. So it was just tough, you know, it was tough. Even when I came to America and I had my business one day, this is when my father had passed. And I got a message from Facebook from some of the siblings that lived there saying that they only had had water and lettuce for like two weeks to eat. And I was very, very upset because it took me back. And so I started a movement called Pound for Pound. For every pound of products we would sell, we would donate a pound of food to orphanages, starting with them. But what I did was I did something that nobody really understood unless you live in a place like that is I actually physically went to Mexico and buy the dried goods and stock that storage room all the way full because Mm -hmm. then I knew that they would be getting the food instead of sending money. Oh, got it. Got it. And so what was your mental state like growing up? And you mentioned that you thought that this was normal. So did you, you mentioned you try to block a few things out, but what was your mental state just growing up until 18 years old, like growing up in the orphanage? I always was thinking of how to come out of there. And I was always visualizing, even though I didn't know what I was doing, Seeing myself as a super successful person, I had long hair, I was Mm -hmm. future gazing and I had this suit and with heels and I was behind this mahogany that like wood desk, beautiful desk. And I would see myself as a super successful person. And I just started doing that out of the sheer, putting my mind in a state constantly of, oh my gosh, that looks beautiful. I need to stay here and I hope for this in the future. And so 
there's moments where I was so fearful that I sometimes thought that I would lose my life, right? But yeah. then when I didn't have those fight or flight moments, then I would occupy my mind with writing these things. Or I was even making vision boards back then. I would cut out little things from books and put them in the board and visualize and think that I was already there and what the future looks like. So I did this for a very, very, very long time. And it, it really, really paid off, I believe. Did you guys have a television growing up? We had one TV, but I think we had like three movies and there were VHS. And that's all we had. And we watched the same movies over and over and over again. Wow. What were those movies? I think one of them was Old Yellard. Okay. The other one was Siembra Dulzura. I can't remember the name and how it, they put it in English. It's okay. And then another one was like a Western that he liked. I think it had young Wayne or something like that. Mm -hmm. John Wayne. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was yes. thinking Lil Wayne. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. No. So basically your visions were created out of just watching those three movies and the books, right? I mean, you grew up so, so poor in poverty. I mean, I can't imagine what the visions could look like in a, such a young age. Where did you find like success? And a lot of times kids look at someone to motivate them or find a hero. But where did you find all this creativity? I believe that it was maybe perhaps born in me because I remember creating tools from watching these movies. I would create my little bow and arrows and my arrows and like little fake guns. And we would have these little like Indians versus cowboys wars, you know, with uh -huh. my siblings. Yeah. I would dream that I was this person that I saw on one of the movies and He's successful and we just got creative because if you think about it, if you would ask any of my biological siblings or adopted, yeah. there was hardly nothing to do there. I mean, it was in the mountains, right? And there was hardly anything like there wasn't a playground or anything. It was just you go to school, you wash your clothes, you do your chores, you make food. And we took turns making food. And then you go to bed. The only thing that I had that a lot of other people didn't have was that I loved horses and I trained and I domesticated horses that they had and I started riding them just because I pushed myself to it. Everybody else was afraid of them. And so I became a horse rider and I was racing these horses almost every single weekend because I wasn't allowed to ride them during the week. So anything, if there's an opportunity to do something different, I would figure it out and do it. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And what about holidays? What were holidays like for you guys in the orphanages? I don't remember too many holidays except for Dia de Reyes, the Three Kings, mm -hmm. and Christmases. And for Christmas, my caregivers would take us plus another 10, 15 kids who were adopted because that's all they could do. And they would actually fly to the United States, to West Virginia, and stay in the little house with his sister and my grandma. That was really, really little. And it was for like a week or so. And then we would just go back to the orphanage. As far as vacation, vacation, I just remember randomly, maybe once or twice going to a beach in Acapulco. <laughs> I remember it was so bad. The hotels had the biggest roaches and stuff. I don't remember like a lot of parent child happy moments just because of, there was just so much going on mm -hmm. did you always know that you were going to come to united states and what was that journey like i didn't know that i was going to come to united states i was okay. actually when i was in junior high i was always looking for something that i could get so good at that could help me buy me a ticket out of where i was and I discovered basketball because soccer was big and I was like, everybody plays soccer, you know, mm -hmm. I discovered basketball in junior high out of my principal's office's TV. It was a little black and white TV. And I asked him if I could start coming to watch him play on my breaks. And he said, yeah. So I just started watching basketball, learning the moves and I started practicing. <laughs> wow. And I got so good because I created techniques and ideas to become such a great ball handler. I remember I had an adopted brother. His name was Pancho. So we were paired up with younger kids. 
when we were older and when we were young, we were paired up with older kids. Like we grew ourselves up, right? Mm -hmm. And one week they would switch us with the kids that we were supposed to take care of. And I was put with Pancho and Pancho couldn't walk. He had spinal bifida. He's one of the kids that they found in the dumpster because the parents threw him away. Wow. So he told us, so I was carrying him wherever I went. So I had this idea and I said, Pancho, would you like to play a game with me? He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to blindfold myself with this rag and you just tell me, stop, right, left, forward and tell me and guide me to this court. And that's how I got so good at basketball because while I was listening to him, I would visualize multitudes of people coming towards me, trying to take the ball from me to the point that I was so good that he stopped giving me commands and I hit my head in the pole and I had to have stitches <laughs> in my forehead. And did he know anything about basketball? No, he didn't. I just told him when I get to the edges of this court, just tell me stop, turn to the right or stop, turn left or oh, stop, turn around. It. So yes, and I became so good that in high school, junior high and high school, we won every championship. And in high school, I was recruited to play basketball for the Mexican national team in Mexico City. And I must have been good because I'm only five foot two. And they were so interested. I got a letter from them. Actually, if people go to gomaggie.com, Maggie with one G, that's my mm -hmm. story video link. Mm -hmm. And you'll see the cave. You'll see me playing basketball. You'll see the letter yeah, from the Mexican yeah, national I watched team. It. Yeah. And so we got this letter and they told us, I went to Mexico City with my caregiver and they told us to wait for three months or so. They would get back to us and we got back to the orphanage. We didn't hear from them and for the longest time. And then one day we went out and they introduced American football and we started to play. And that day I broke my collarbone and my caregiver was a doctor. So he told me that my dreams were over <laughs> because he knew how good I've gotten with basketball mm -hmm. and he knew that I wanted to play. And then several days later, the Mexican national team called and I couldn't play. And so it was very devastating for me, but I don't know. I just believe that, oh my gosh, like this just happened, but there must be something else. There must be something better. There must be a reason. And so I just kept hoping. And my parents took a bus to the U.S. one summer because they were raising funds for the orphanage and we were just stopping in different places. And this was probably four, five months later after I broke my collarbone and they invited us to a picnic in West Virginia at a Catholic church. And when we arrived, there was a basketball court outside. And who invited you? So it was people who supported the orphanage who oh, donated. Got it. got it. So they invited us to this picnic and there was a basketball court outside and we started to play. And there happened to be the coach of the University of Charleston and she saw me play and she was invited. And she told my caregiver that she wanted to offer me a scholarship to play at the university. And that's why I'm speaking to you today. Wow. Okay. Okay. So I have a lot of follow-up questions. Why do you call your parents your caregiver and not like mom or dad? Or you go in and out kind of. Yes. Yes. It feels weird to call them mom and dad because I was never, ugh, this is so sad. I never felt connected to them like a dad, mom or dad, because I never had that relationship. I don't think any of us did, just because there was just so much. And it feels weird to call somebody mom and dad if they weren't there for you. Like you would want to, especially what I've learned later in life, like what a real family is. So I call them people who cared for us, like daily or provided. So it's tough. Even when he passed, I went down to Mexico to bury him and I didn't have any emotions. And I was like, why am I not feeling anything? And then one of my friends who's like a father figure to me here in America passes away eight months ago and I'm crying my eyeballs out. I'm like, what's going on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just different. I guess it's my experience because if you talk to other of my siblings, biological siblings, they have different experiences too. They mm -hmm. suffered differently. They had different relationships. And obviously my character was very, very strong because I didn't want to be taken advantage of. I didn't want to be raped. A lot of my sisters were raped. I was almost <laughs> raped at the orphanage by this much older guy when I was a little kid and I broke his nose with my hands. And 
So I decided to become this strong character, like a tomboy, to fend for myself Mm -hmm. and that nobody would hurt me. So I think that that really, truly helped me, especially Mm -hmm. in life. But then I had to later on work on balancing my femininity and my masculinity because (laughs) you need balance in everything that you do in life and in business, right? Wow. So touching. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Okay, so thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. And how old were you when you came to University of Charleston? I was 17, almost 18 when I came to the University of Charleston. Okay, and did your parents allow that to happen? Were they opposed to it by any chance? Or they said, okay, once you're 18, you can just go anywhere? No, I think it was an opportunity. And they saw that and they saw that I love basketball. And I had lost an opportunity in Mexico. And so the first thing that they did was they put me on a school before going to the university to learn English because I didn't know any English. I knew the basic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And that was just to pass the TOEFL exam just to get in the university and I barely passed it. (laughs) Wow! And then I was admitted to the university. And I really believe that I'm so grateful and thankful. Now I say that when I was there, There's nobody in the university that was Latin American, so nobody spoke Spanish. So I really had to learn English. Perhaps that's why my English is better than my siblings. Just because I didn't have any other options, I just had to full on learn a new language, a new culture and live in it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I hear a lot on this show. A lot of people will say when they come to the United States and they live in the same house where they speak their native language, they don't learn English very well. So they, a lot of times they say, okay, I'm going to go and live at the dorm so I can just learn yes. English the right way and learn it really good. <laughs> and yes. it seems like, yeah, it seems like that's what you did, which allowed you to progress in your English language. So I want to hear a little bit about the struggles when you first came to the university you didn't know any English, you were learning this. And tell me a little bit about that, because this is probably a brand new world to you. You were so succumbed to a completely different forest-like life in Mexico. And this is now a humongous university. Were you lost? Were you confused? What were the struggles that you went through? I was scared. I was scared. (laughs) I was scared of people. In my culture, the way that I grew up, I found that Americans would get very close to my face and I was very scared. And so I had a host family. My parents set me up with a family who would host me for the first part of my years here. And I remember I would go to the basement and I would lock myself in my room. I probably locked myself for close to two years and I was just watching TV and trying to pronounce and learn and repeat what the TV was saying in English. and. Then I got a little bit more comfortable, but I had a basketball team member. (laughs) She's so awesome. Her name is Jamie Totten, and she was the tallest, best post player that we had in the team. And thanks to her, she befriended me. Every single time she got to get close to me, she would approach me and try to speak Spanish or try to make me feel comfortable. I love her. Uh If I could hug her right now, just because she was there for me in a way that nobody else showed up, just because she took the initiative and she saw that I was struggling. So what about like maneuvering around campus? Did you ever have a feeling to go back to Mexico at all? No, never. (laughs) Okay. No, I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to go back because so they were very religious, like non-denominational Christians. And it was always black or white. There's no gray in between, right? Who was this? The host family? No, my caregivers, my parents. Oh, got it. Uh Uh-huh. And so... When I was in college, I was 21 years old. I think it was my couple of years into it. And I came out to them as gay. <laughs> and how they say, oh, hell broke loose. It really mm-hmm. broke loose. And so he really wanted to take me back to Mexico. But I knew that it was only going to be a brainwash because I knew my feelings and I knew. And so he told me that I would never amount to anything, that I would die in prison and with AIDS. And this is what he would tell me every single morning at 5 a.m. And I understand the power of affirmations in the subconscious mind, especially when you wake up, because it's when the mind is most programmable. And that's why I do my affirmations and meditations when I wake up or before I go to bed, because then you can influence and it becomes like such a tremendous power to shape your destiny. 
And one day I just told him, listen, never again call me and tell me that I'm going to hell or I'm never going to speak to you. The moment I did that, and it was very huge for me because this is a guy who's big, huge energies, over six feet tall. Nobody ever, ever stands up to him. And when I did that, he cried like a baby and he stopped. And I'm so glad he did because then I could start feeling better about myself. And so, yeah, it was a struggle. It was a really big struggle Mm -hmm. for me. Wow. Okay. And so you finished college at University of Charleston. And what did you do next? So when I graduated, I couldn't find a job. There's, I graduated with a degree as an interior designer, and there's okay. only two companies that had businesses there. And I reached out and I couldn't get a job. So I just started living out of my car in the winter and I would just sleep in parking lots. And then one day I was driving through this hill in West Virginia and my engine blew up. And so I just grabbed my bags and started living in the woods and going to like gas stations to heat up my ramen noodles or something, pretending like I was a customer. But I really didn't know that I was homeless because I lived in the woods in Mexico. So it wasn't like I was in suffering, you know, per se. It was just a different perspective. And what happened was that I was in a side street one day and one of the cooks at the University of Charleston, she knew me well because she knew how I was excelling in my studies and with sports because I played three sports with scholarships too. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so I was known. And so she was like, what the heck are you doing? And so she, she ran into you. Yeah, she ran into me and she took me and she found me a place to stay. And then within weeks from that happening, I was actually signed up to enter a salsa contest for the state of West Virginia, a fresh salsa contest by my friends that I went to college with. And and the reason why they did that is because when I was in college, I used to make this fresh pico de gallo salsa Uh and they loved it. And so they would tell my teachers and my teachers would have me bring it to class. (laughs) So it's a big thing. And so they signed me up and they let me know. And I, by the way, I was staying, she got me a place to stay at the dorms. Because by that time, nobody was living there. So the president allowed that. So that's how I knew. And that's how I actually ended up. I ended up going to this contest. And it was so interesting because they called it Fresh Salsa. Mm -hmm. The other contestants for the state, there was, I think, 15 of us. They all brought their salsas. And it was like a cook, like a tostito salsa. Mine was the only fresh salsa. And at the time, I didn't realize that really fresh salsa was a new thing in America, especially in West Virginia. So I took advantage of that opportunity and I won the entire contest. It was by people's choice and all the judges voted, right? Wow. At the end of the contest, I remember it was like Mexican music, sombreros, balloons, (laughs) and people were over to my table were like, oh my gosh, your salsa is so awesome. Where can we buy it? Where can we buy it? And I was telling them I don't sell it anywhere. And I was telling them part of the struggle just in like a conservative way. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was a man dressed in a suit. And you know, when you're talking to people and somebody's really looking at you very strongly. Yeah. And you feel their energy. Yeah. That's how this felt. And this guy, this older guy in the suit was looking at me and I didn't really look at him because I was focusing on the people in front of me. Mm -hmm. When they left, he approached my table and he said, I see a fire in you. And I can tell that if you had the means to make something like this happen, that you would be successful. And he pulled out, he said, I'm going to do something for you. And he pulled out his wallet from his pocket and he said, here's $800, but I will give this to you in one condition. And I said, what's that? And he said, that one day when you become successful, you pay it forward. And he never gave me his name. I never knew how to reach out to him. I was just dumbfounded. And that moment, I decided that this is an opportunity. It's salsa. Like, I have no idea. It's just salsa. I have an interior design degree. I'm going to take it. So, And you never saw him after that? No, never, ever, ever again saw him. Mm -hmm. I just remember his face. 
Mm. And he was really well dressed. So I started my company. I just went to Google how to start a company, how to do everything. And I started bootstrapped with 800 bucks. And I grew this company in several years to a million dollars, more than a million dollars without any funding or anything. Because I couldn't get money from banks. They wouldn't loan me money Mm -hmm. because I had nothing to show for. So I really, truly bootstrapped myself into success just by doing research. And I did reach out to people. I did ask for help, but I was rejected. (laughs) So I just decided, people ask me, did you have a mentor? And I said, I wish, but now I'm a mentor to entrepreneurs, right? Because I'm at a place where there's some entrepreneurs who are at the place that I was that I can help. And that's why I love what I do now. Yeah. Because I realized that, yes, you can change the world and make somebody's tummy feel really good for 10 minutes enjoying your products. But what if you could make an impact in their minds and their hearts? How much of a difference would that be? Wow. Wow. So awesome. I have a lot of follow up questions now. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So how long were you homeless for until that lady found you and took you in and placed you in the dorms? It was roughly around three months. Three months. Okay. And you kind of just didn't know that this was wrong because you kind of lived in the forest and back in Mexico. So you kind of just figured things out on your own, right? Yes. Okay. Awesome. And how old were you when that gentleman gave you $800? at that salsa competition? I was 22 going on 23. So I think I started my business right around 23 years old. 23 years old. Okay. Okay. So tell me more. How, okay, so you went on Google. What did you start Googling first? Did you start finding a company name or did you start finding a commercial kitchen to start doing this? Or what did you start doing first? Well, I didn't know a lot of things. And one thing that I started doing when I won the contest, the only place that would take my products because they knew them was the market in the capital. And so I started making the products in my kitchen where I was staying in the little kitchen. In the dorms? By that time, I had moved to a different place. Okay. And I was living with someone else. It was like a townhouse sort of thing. And I was making my products there. So I just started Googling. The first thing that I Googled was how to make a website. Okay. (laughs) How to design labels, how to get labels, what kind of labels to get. Well, and even before that, how to register a business, how to register for taxes, like the basic stuff first. And then it grew into how to get products, cost of goods like tomatoes, onions, garlic, Mm -hmm. cilantro, and all that. Not from the supermarket, but wholesale, because I was doing the numbers. And if I was to buy the tomatoes and everything from Kroger or Publix or wherever you are, like supermarket, Mm -hmm. the cost of that would be much higher and I wasn't going to turn a profit. So I had to figure out how to get wholesale and lower prices. Mm -hmm. And and how did you figure that out? So I stocked a supermarket (laughs) and I asked them when their produce truck would come in. (laughs) (laughs) I <laughs> guess I wanted the best fresh produce. Yeah. And they said, oh, it comes every Wednesday at this time, or I can't remember the date. So yeah. I was just sitting in the parking lot and I noticed that the big tractor trailer went to the back and I went to the back and I talked to them and I found out their name. And then I called the company and they started supplying me with products and literally huge, huge saver, huge saver. And did they start dropping semi trucks worth of tomatoes and cilantro and all the other stuff at your townhouse or how did that happen? No. So what happened was when I started making the products for the capital market, the Department of Agriculture that worked with the FDA noticed my new products. So they reached out to me and they said, we need to inspect your kitchen before we can approve you for distribution. I was like, what? Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's when I started understanding about regulations. And I realized that I couldn't make my products in my little kitchen anymore, that I had to rent a kitchen that had like triple sink, wash, rinse, sanitize and all that, all the requirements. So I went looking for a kitchen and I found one that they would let me rent, but it was an hour away. So 
every day I started going an hour away to make my products in this kitchen, coming back and selling them to friends. And that's really how the company grew. So you had to drive an hour away every day to make your, okay, the salsa. Okay. So, and then at what point did you start hiring people? Did you run this all by yourself? So I decided one day that I was going to sit down. And at that time I was selling a lot of product, what I consider a lot to friends. And I started selling it to two other mom and pop stores in town, which knew about me because they put me in the newspapers and they called me and I started selling like the products. So I decided one day that I was going to make this long list of stores to call because I was going to go big and I categorized them from the smallest to the largest supermarkets around me. Mm -hmm. And it was so scary. I started picking up the phone and cold calling if they wanted a fresh salsa product in their stores. And I felt so terrible because first of all, I was scared to make a call. Second of all, I was so hurt that how they responded to me on the phone, the rejections. Mm -hmm. One day I got 90 rejections, 90 no's. Oh my and goodness. I was so devastated. I was so exhausted. And I just put the phone down and I decided that I need to figure out how to do something different. And that's one of the things that I've learned as an entrepreneur is if something's not working, you have to figure out how to change it up to create the results that you want. So I remember one of my friends entered the room that I was making the calls and she was like, what are you doing? You're not making any money. Just get a freaking job. Just get a job and start making money. And I remember calling a company that had ready to eat products like salads and stuff in town. And I said, how did you get into the supermarkets? And she says, they're not going to listen to you. It took us so many years to get our products in or one product in. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like what have I gotten into? Yeah. And I decided the next day I sat down and it was very scary. I took that list and I turned it upside down. And now at the top of the list was the Whole Foods Market, which is the largest organic retailer in the United States. And I had a fresh product, so I thought they were perfect. And I picked up the phone and I called and I said, hey, my name is Maria Magdalena de la Cruz Garcia. I have an awesome pico de gallo de salsa. I think you guys would love it. And I was so glad that they didn't answer. I just <laughs> left a message. <laughs> and they called me the next day. I got a call wow. the next day. And it was 6 p.m. I was in the city center park in the city center in my little car. And he says, this is Eric. Is this Maggie? And I said, yeah. He says, this is Eric with Whole Foods. We learned about you. Want more? When can you come? It's like, oh, my God. Uh -oh. <laughs> and uh, so they met the next day at 9 a.m. And I was in West Virginia. They were in Maryland. And so I said, I'll be there. So I went back to the kitchen, drove an hour, made the product, packed it up, drove all night long put on a little dress, my heels, everything, my salsa and my chips. And I arrived into their main Mid-Atlantic distribution center and walked through the door. And there was this big room with this big table and all these guys standing up, receiving me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, no. And <laughs> and I put the product down. I opened the chips and I said, help yourself. And they opened the products and started eating them. All of a sudden, Eric gets up and he says, oh, my gosh, we love your products. When can we have them? And I said, well, how much do you need? And he said, well, your first order is going to be for 10,000 pounds of salsa. <gasps> and I was like, I paused. <laughs> <laughs> I said, am I hearing this right? Is this 10,000, one ton of salsa? He says, yeah, and that will be your order for every week. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So at the wow. time I was making about 250 pounds of salsa and selling it to friends for $5 a pint. So I said, I just need to go back and figure it out and I'll be right with you. And so one of the challenges that I had was that I didn't have any money for cost of goods, just for cost of goods, yeah. containers, labels, everything. I had to have $20,000. And because banks won't loan me money, I decided, okay, I need to get money and let me see if I can get it from friends, but how can I ensure that they'll get paid? Like that's the only way that they're going to let me borrow it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I went to Whole Foods and I said, is there anything that you can give me that guarantees that you pay me? They said, yeah, it's called a contract. And I said, okay, great. <laughs> so, so I signed the contract and it showed that they would pay me every week. So I borrowed $20,000 and 
And I said, hey, look, they'll pay me every week and you can have your money back in a week. And they said, great. Every week I was paid $40,000 from then on. That year I went from making $12,000 to $1.9 million just with Whole Foods. Wow. This is, you said in one year? Yes. To over $1 million. Okay. And where did you say you were able to borrow that $20,000 from initially? Was that the bank? No, that these were friends. Oh, There's friends. Bank, yeah, banks won't loan me money. Oh, okay. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And so how long did it take you from 23 years old when you first decided to do this until the Whole Foods picked you up? I think it was a couple of years before I did the Whole Foods because the first couple of years I was trying to figure out how to establish myself as a business, mm-hmm. how to at least get containers, get a website, get my truck driver's license, everything. So I was in the process of setting myself up. Yeah. So once I decided to go big, this is when this happened. And then I had to realize, oh my gosh, there's just one person, me and another helper. I have to get team members. Mm-hmm. So it's a true story. I went to the Small Business Administration and I said, hey, I need people. Can you recommend where to find them? And they said, oh yeah, just go to the state. They'll provide what you need. And I said, okay, great. Went to the state. I said, I need 20 people for the Whole Foods order. And they said, no problem. Tomorrow you'll have them. I said, oh, okay. Got them to the next day. I remember all these guys and girls. I put them in this room that I rented from the city. And I said, hey, guys, my name is Maggie Cook. I have this awesome pico de gallo salsa. said, you guys are going to love it. Look, we just got a contract from Whole Foods. And I really, truly believe that this can become the greatest salsa company in the United States, maybe the world. And you guys are going to help me take it there. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, they were so excited. (laughs) So we got started. We got started working. And it was an ever-changing manufacturing process. Everything was always changing every day because we were accommodating things for growth, equipment, and different things. And every day at lunch, I would set everybody down and we would share food and I would buy them food. And we would always talk about how we could improve the manufacturing process to make it quicker, easier, less burdensome and all that. And we finished one day, everybody goes in and we were sitting outside in these rocks and this African-American guy stays behind. I said, hey, what's up? He says, just wanted to talk to you privately. I said, okay. He says, thank you so much for giving me a job. Nobody would hire me. I just came out of prison and I did this, this and that. And I was like, oh my God, la, 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 la. said, listen, you're awesome. <laughs> Let's just go back to work. You are a great worker. You really are. He says, don't worry about that. Just go back to work. Wow. So I rushed out of the production area and I got on the phone. I called the state and they provided me with all the people that came out of jail or work release or have to go back to jail. But they were the best working people I ever had because I married them to my purpose, my why, the ultimate outcome of becoming one of the greatest salsa companies in the world and the way that I was treating them, the emotional intelligence behind growing that culture. It was so impacting that to this day, I still think that people who think that they don't have an opportunity and get one are probably some of the people that appreciate it the most. Wow. Oh my goodness. Amazing. Okay. So I wanted to ask you, you got $800 initially. How long did that last you? And what did you do when the money ran out? So first thing I did was I bought a little food processor to cut my tomatoes and everything. Okay. And, and the rest of it I use for containers and tomatoes and cost of goods. And so what I was doing, this is when I just started. Yeah. I was making the product and I was selling it by the pint. I was making it by the gallon, selling it by the pint Mm -hmm. and reinvesting that money back into buying more tomatoes, more containers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how it grew. And I remember I had a like a thick thing of one in five dollar bills and I would wave it in the air in my office with the door closed saying, woohoo, I'm a millionaire. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. You're you're just so filled with visions. And I love how you said that you just kept on going back to your creativity and really just going back to the place where you were a young child at the orphanage and creating these visions of being successful. And this was all just coming back to you, I'm sure. And, and you started from very, very 
small upcomings and and beginnings and just grew this amazing, amazing company. And so when you got the 20 employees initially, were you still driving an hour away to the commercial kitchen or did you find something closer? Yes, I was using that kitchen for several years and then I moved closer when I was able to rent an old KFC kitchen on the west side of Charleston, which was like the worst area, area with gangs and drugs and all that stuff. (laughs) But I found it very cheap and I moved everything there and I had a like a eight by 10 cooler. So I had to rent a refrigerated truck outside just to keep the rest of the stuff cold and keep it running. And I remember there was, they called it the drunk tank. It was a place right next to the KFC that would house people who had drug addiction and alcohol problems and like for rehab. Mm -hmm. And there was a bar, a nightclub across the road from me. There was a lot of shootings. (laughs) Wow. And sometimes we would find the tape around there in the mornings. And then the projects were on the other side. And there was a lot of ambulances and people, over, I, I saw a lot of overdosing and stuff like that. So I got my concealed weapons permit and I hired people from the projects. They were awesome workers. And the girls would come in because sometimes we had to produce at night and would pull out these huge hammers out of their pants and put them, <laughs> and put them on the table. I'm like, oh my gosh, you are prepared. And they're like, yep. So yeah, that's really how the next stage of the business was. Wow. And so well, you guys went into Whole Foods. Did you go into any other supermarkets after that? And how quick did that happen? Yes. So I have these mindset strategies and things that I used to achieve my success in life and actually talk about these in my book, Mindful Success. And what I talk about is the manifestation process and the course and what it takes to make something believable. How to use your mind to transform your life. And I started applying these principles. I knew these from the orphanage, but I started really honing in, focusing, because when you focus on something, you really begin to manifest things that you want. And so I decided one day that I was going to write a list of all these things that I wanted. And one of them was I would love, I'm so grateful and thankful now that I am the largest supermarket in the world by the state or something better. That was my affirmation. And then my other affirmations after that were the feeling of being there, like I'm shaking the hand of the buyer, the biggest, largest buyer in the world of the supermarket. I can smell the products in the air, getting all the emotions, all the techniques that I was applying And I didn't say which supermarket because I always said or something better. If God or the universe, however you relate to that, has always got something better, then I'm open for that. And so I had these affirmations and I was full with them because there's some certain things that you need to incorporate in order to make manifest things. And I've manifested and I know how they work, right? And so it took about 29 days. I was in my office. I got a call. And the lady says, hey, my name is Dee. We were looking online at 10 different companies. We looked at yours and we think yours is the best. Do you want to sell your products in Walmart? And I was like, what? And I said, hold on, hold on. And I put it on mute and I went over to the living room and I told my business partner, hey, it's Walmart. They want our products. She says, hang up. It's a prank. (laughs) (laughs) And I just realized, okay, I got to pinch myself because I've been dreaming this and I already believe that it's here. Why am I doubting this? How long did you do those affirmations for? 29 days. And this was, you were already in Whole Foods and you started doing these affirmations and then Walmart called you. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. I'm getting goosebumps. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And so I was in Bentonville, Arkansas, a month later, going through exactly how I visualized the process, the buyer shaking his hand. He says, you are the Sam Walton of West Virginia. I got goosebumps. Wow. He opened the products, smelled and tasted them. And then that's when our journey with Walmart, Sam's Clubs began. We were already in other supermarkets, but I really wanted to grow the company to the next level. And so that happened because I applied certain things to make them happen. And I was super laser sharp focused on exactly what I wanted. And now the task was to how to improvise, how to grow in order to be able to supply and 
This is when I found a 20,000 square foot facility, two floors, and set up manufacturing processes for cheese dips, guacamoles, and salsas. And we just began our 24-7 manufacturing, hundreds of employees. Night and day, I would sleep in the office. Truckloads of salt out tomatoes now, uh, cilantro, everything. And we just grew very quickly, very fast. Wow. Amazing. Oh my goodness. What an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I am going to have to pick up your book and put it on the show notes for all of our listeners. Okay. So Maggie, how long did you run your business until you sold it to Campbell Soup? And then what made you decide to sell? So I had it about 10 years and a half, maybe 11, close to 11. Okay. And it was an opportunity that came up and I decided to sell because I truly believe that what happened was that when my caregiver told me that I would never amount to anything, that I would die in prison and with AIDS, I was so determined to prove him wrong that that was my why. Mm. But my why was misplaced because it was based on fear. Mm -hmm. When he passed, I understood, oh my gosh, who am I going to prove wrong now? <laughs> so I had to redefine, and this is what I teach in my online courses and, and when I speak. I had to redefine my why, unleash my superhero, and really focus on my true destiny, what I truly am here for, to fulfill on this earth. And my why changed from having to prove someone wrong to what is the greater purpose. And this is when I realized you feed people for a few minutes, but you can give somebody how to feed themselves, and they'll feed themselves for a lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is when I shifted and I knew that salsa was just a stepping stone for something greater. When the opportunity came to sell, a lot of people told me, oh my gosh, you're going to get rid of your baby. It's going to be so mm -hmm. sad. Are you going to suffer? And I said, no, I'm letting go so that greater things come up my way so that I can make a greater impact. Mm -hmm. And that's in the, the track, the path that I'm in today as a international speaker, as a bootstrapped business coach. and I love what I do because I'm able to impact people's lives in many different ways and industries, many different levels. Wow. Amazing. And did you sell it for, was it $231 million? Yes. Yes. So it sold with Garden Fresh for $231 million. Okay. Got it. And did Campbell's Soup just pick up the phone and call you and pitch that opportunity for you? Or how did that happen? It was something that was negotiated with Garden Fresh. And so... It was probably, that instance, probably the highlight of my life because wow. I knew that they could take it and make it so much bigger. Whether that they took my brand and named it under their banner, they still had something great that was distributed all over the United States. And at the time that I sold, I was in 38 states in different supermarkets. Mm -hmm. So yes, it was probably the highlight of my business life that was paving the perfect path for my next level of doing, which is what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. Okay. So at one point in time, you wanted to go back to Mexico and to help out more kids and more orphanages. Are you still doing that? And what was that journey like for you? So when I sold the company, I got a call from someone in Mexico telling me that these kids were going to be taken away by a drug cartel and that 50 people were on their way to this place, this orphanage. And I just completely, I would just put it in short terms. It was the fastest flight I've ever flown, especially from Michigan to Mexico, five hours I was there. Mm -hmm. And I arrived, we started rescuing these little boys and girls who were sex trafficked and they were destroyed. And mm -hmm. the first thing that I did was we put these kids in a room and me and my brother, I had a 38 special handgun and he had a, a Chisa shotgun, like a handmade shotgun. Oh my goodness. And we had these kids in a room and we would watch them and we would sleep outside. And then I had this idea to, during the day where everything seemed safer, to go to town and befriend the federales and the military. And I did. And they came with their biggest guns. I mean, unbelievable. Awesome. 
and they would stay at the orphanage and they would patrol the orphanage. And I would wake up like at four or five in the morning and make them coffee and cookies because I wanted them to keep coming back. And yeah. so, and I told the villagers, I said, let everybody that you know that I'm in town and if anybody tries to go in this place that we're armed and ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we only had, we weren't armed and ready, really. I mean, we had very limited resources, but yeah. it was just a statement to say, don't even think about coming in here, whoever you are. And so mm -hmm. there were some really scary moments at times there and the kids, I think, kind of knew, but there was older adults that were there. And I specifically pulled them aside and I said, do not show that you're afraid because they can feel it. Mm -hmm. I know they probably feel it, but just don't show it, like don't physically show it. And so it was a very, very scary time. I still have, I think the pictures are in, in that video, the gomaggy.com. Mm -hmm. You see when we're getting ready and what we had to do. And I remember tying up this dog to my waist with a piece of rope because she was barking at anything that moved. And I was so tired from staying up all night that it was perfect because if anything was coming, she would bark and shake me up and I would get up. But thank goodness, I say sometimes people give with money or with things and sometimes people give there with their lives. I felt like I could die at any moment because anything could happen right here in Mexico yeah. in the middle of mountains. So I'm so grateful. And I said to myself, I'll never do this again, <laughs> but I would, I would do it again because if you would just see those kids those little kids, the little two, three, four-year-old boys and girls who are scarred for life. And it took months to get them to smile, to even feel like they were safe or normal once we rescued them. And what did you do with the kids when you rescued them? So we went to court and I paid out a lot, a lot of money to the government to take custody of them. And mm. they are in a place in Mexico living in an environment where they're getting education, food, clothing, and they're thriving. And so did you open a new orphanage to host these kids or did you place them into different homes? It's expanded now. It's expanded. But what we're doing is we're not taking as much kids as we had when I was growing up because we learned from that. Mm -hmm. So you opened a new orphanage for these kids? We opened a new location in Morelia. Oh. Got it. Okay. How many kids did you adopt? We didn't adopt them. I didn't want to repeat the same thing that my caregivers did. We yeah. just got the right to house them there. The custody. Custody. Okay. How many kids was that? 31 kids. Wow. So, so amazing. And what about now? Do you still go back and help that facility out? Are you actively going back and forth from Mexico? Not right now because of COVID-19. But everybody's safe. And yeah. when we have the opportunity, we will again. Okay. So Maggie, I did want to ask you, what does the American dream mean to you? Opportunity, period. Being in the country that I came from, I know for a fact that I wouldn't have the same opportunities to have the freedom. And all you need is a willingness to do something and figure out what it is that you want to do and focus on it and make it become a reality with the right strategies, the right tools so that you can grow, getting the help that you need. Because I will tell you that I couldn't get the help that I, and I stopped asking for help. Do not stop asking for help. Find somebody who's done it that can get you there. Because when you get somebody that helps you, you shorten the time frame you become successful and your American dream becomes more real quicker. Mm -hmm. And it's really about being resourceful with yourself, with the resources that you have within you. It's all about being resilient. This means you bend, but you don't break. And it's all about being relentless, doing whatever it takes to succeed. And you will succeed if you stay focused on your ultimate outcome. Mm hmm and those affirmations that you talk about in the book, right? Yes. <laughs> that definitely helped tremendously. So that's amazing. Maggie, I did want to ask you one other question I forgot while we were talking about your business. So you started to, you got 20 employees like overnight, and then you yes. grew and grew and grew. And how were you able to manage that? 
how were you able to manage the employees, the hiring and the ongoing business? Did you pick up any business books? Did you get on a few calls to like figure out how this works? Or you just went all in and said, I'll figure it out when I get there. (laughs) Exactly. I went all in and I said, I'm going to figure it out when I get there. But the biggest lesson that I learned was I grew up in this orphanage, right? And it was like big production because you had all these kids, but we weren't managed correctly. We weren't given the resources. And I decided to do the completely opposite here with my business and create a family environment to the point that my team members would beg me to stay and work more or just stay and sleep at the plant because the environment was so much better than at home. And I'll give you an example. My mother came to visit one day from Mexico. And I, this was when I was already in the 20,000 square facility. And she was sitting in my office and I was talking to her. And one of my team members, his name was Lonnie, comes in and he knocks on the door. And I say, yeah, come in, Lonnie. And he says, and he gets really close to me and he says, Maggie, I just want you to know, and he grabs my shoulder, that somebody threw beer bottles outside in the brick building. And I just want you to know that I went over there and picked it up with a broom, okay? And I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. And I gave him a hug. Thank you so much, Lonnie. And he laughed and my mom says, oh my God, they're like a family. (laughs) And I said, I said, that's a real family, mom. That's a real family. And she cried. Yeah. Wow. Oh, oh my goodness. So touching. (laughs) So Maggie, what's next for you? What are some business goals for the next couple of years? My goal is to continue to share my message and my bootstrapped business strategies with entrepreneurs and immigrants and people who really need and organizations who want to go to the next level. And so I'm continuing to speak. I'm speaking a lot virtually right now. Mm -hmm. And I have online programs that I provide. And also I do coaching and I coach entrepreneurs and businesses to go from where they are to where they want to be. If they want to grow to six figures, seven figures or more, I've been there. And so I'm that resource to help and empower their journey. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm growing so rapidly and I'm looking forward to growing more so that I can touch more people in a bigger way. Mm, I hope you touch millions and millions of people through your journey. So Maggie, let's speak to the immigrants that are listening. Talk to them. What are some things that you would advise to the next aspiring immigrant that wants to start their own business? If anybody tells you that you don't have that great of a chance because you're a minority, don't believe them. Because I will tell you that when I was growing my business in West Virginia, as a woman, as an LGBTQ member of that society. And I had all the, what you consider all the misadvantages, right? Mm -hmm. But I always look at people as the same as me, including my team members. I'm no higher or lower. We're all spiritual beings having a human experience. We're all important. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that you believe that you're less, you are less. To the degree that you believe that you are much more than what you think you are, you are more. And when you open yourself to that type of energy, you begin to receive and see and manifest the people, place, and the circumstances that are going to take you to where you want to be. I'll give you a perfect, perfect example. When Walmart reached out to me, the reason why they reached out to me was because they had come up with a $4 billion program to support women and minority-owned businesses to bring more people like me to empower them to make a difference. Don't tell me that's a disadvantage, right? Yeah. (laughs) So there are opportunities, but when you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. There's a famous quote by Dr. Wayne Dyer. It's so true. Change the way that you look at the world and the world begins to change for you. The question is, what do you choose to focus on? So that's my advice for you. So, so powerful. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. So Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I truly appreciate you sharing your journey. And I really, really hope that you continue to inspire so many immigrants, so many entrepreneurs to really live out the dreams no matter what. And you're already doing that. So I wish you the best of successes. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey. 
Thank you. Have a wonderful day and keep inspiring also. Love your podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If there are any links that were mentioned in this episode, make sure to check them out on my website under this episode to find all the links conveniently located in the show notes. I just wanted to ask for a quick favor. If you could please leave a review wherever you're at listening to this podcast. Also, if you're an immigrant entrepreneur and would love to be on my podcast, please email me and we'll get connected. I'll see you guys all next time for another exciting and impactful episode. Take care.